In this problem, we begin with a line charge distribution from 0 all the way out to some point L, which is on the x, which is on the x plane, or the x coordinate axis. I'm going to go ahead and write that. And this is on the z axis right here. So this is the uh, this is a line charge which is infinitely small, right? Infinitely thin, all the way out to from zero to L. And then we also have a point charge. We want to know well, not we don't have a point charge, but we want to know what the electric field would feel at this point here. And this point right here is going to be at exactly z, right? So what z means is that it could vary anywhere from here, 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 just some arbitrary point that we can just put in and uh, try to figure out where that would be, what, what the electric field would be at that point. So we, of course, begin with our definition from the electric field in the most general sense that we can. Well, not the complete most general sense, but we just begin with what we worked with at uh, within the textbook, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And then it is the integral from, in our case, it's from 0 all the way to L, right? So we're just taking the point, the electric field here, and just adding them all up as we go all the way out from 0 to L on the x-coordinate axis, so 0 to L. And that is uh, going to have a ratio here between the, uh, the, the separation vector and the uh, separation distance squared. And then we have our dq here. So again, what we want to notice here is that we'll just go ahead and draw out some arbitrary... Um, arbitrary distances here. So we know that from from here. Actually, we'll just go ahead and say that we'll, we'll take some differentially small piece here, which is this is going to be uh, dx, right? Some arbitrarily small portion of this x-axis of the line charge here. And then we're going to go ahead and draw the position vector for it, which of course is going to be denoted by uh, the vector r prime. And since this is only on the x-coordinate plane right here, this is actually just going to be defined here as, or simplified down as like x and pointing in the x direction, right? So this is going to be all the way from some, some point x, right? And it's always going to point in the x direction. And the same thing goes with whenever we point to our point that we want to find out our electric field at, at this point. It's going to go emanate from the origin all the way to some arbitrary point z, and that's denoted by the vector r, and that's only going to, it's going to have some sort of magnitude as in the z direction, and point in that z direction too, so right here. So we do know that, so once we already have those defined, we can go ahead and set up for the r, but right now I want to concentrate on this dq portion right here. So in the problem, we're also given that the, uh, the we're also given the line charge density right here, right? So if that's charge per unit length, we know that some infinitesimally small charge portion found right here is just that line charge density times some infinitely small portion, which is just dx right here. So we can go ahead and just make that substitution into this dq right here. And just to make things organized, keep things organized, I'll just I'll light up the steps like I typically do, make the substitution right here. And so we can go ahead and exchange this. So we'll just call this the same as this portion all the way right here. The integral stays the same. And this ratio here also stays the same. And then we just now have our lambda dx. And since this is actually constant, we can just go ahead and bring that out in the next step here. But I'll just go ahead and keep it there for now. So the next thing that we want really want to kind of attack right now, I guess, is in no particular order, is this uh, this this vector unit vector portion right here. So we went ahead and defined these two values here, and actually I'm just going to go ahead and move this this one over right here. We went ahead and defined these two values as they point up in this direction and point to this here. And so what we also know from the lesson within the chapter is that the R vector, the separation vector, which is the, the vector that points from each contributing portion of that line charge density all the way pointing to our point right here, that is equal to, of course, if in the more general sense, the magnitude times the direction. And in our sense, if we can go ahead and write it out here, it's actually defined as the R minus the R prime. 
right? Since our r is defined as this one and our r prime is defined as that one, we can go ahead and just write it more explicitly here as z, z hat minus x, x hat, right? And visually, we can draw this as well as it emanating from this point here all the way to our point in the line field, right? And that is our separation vector. And that makes sense, right? It's going to have some negative portion pointing from the, in the negative uh, x hat direction and then some positive pointing portion in the z hat direction. So that seems to line up right there as well. And so since we're actually trying to figure out a good way to represent this in the things that we know, which is all this stuff right here, we'll just go ahead and solve for this r hat vector in terms of this stuff. So we'll just draw it explicitly here where the separation vector, unit vector, is actually equal to, again, we just take this and then divide it off over here, which is the z z hat minus x x hat divided by r, the separation vector. And again, uh, you know, when things get more complicated and, and more problems, I highly suggest just starting off from these kind of like first principles kind of things. It helps keep things uh, from getting too complicated and, and it's just a best practice, especially whenever you come on like test day or something or you get encountered a, a problem that you just don't know and you're just like, what's going on? And you can just basically just come from the very start here. I, I highly recommend it. And so now we're gonna go ahead and attack what is, uh, what is R squared here? Or actually, what is just R, right? More general sense. So we know that if we look at this as a triangle here, right? So that the uh, if this is one leg and this is Z and this is another leg and this is X and you know this is R from Pythagorean's theorem, of course, we would know that the R squared R squared is equal to Z squared plus X squared, right? It's that triangle right here. And then we go ahead and just solve for the separation vector. This can just turn into... Uh, the square root of z squared plus x squared. So so we, we, we're we armed with all this stuff here. But again, let's just do one substitution at the time. We originally went on off of that one. So we'll go ahead and make the substitution that the r, the separation unit vector, is equal to z, z hat minus x, x hat divided by r. And go ahead and write this. I'm just gonna go ahead and bring that line charge density out in the front here since it's a constant. It moves through the integral, which is from zero to L. And now we made that substitution for the unit vector. So it's z, z hat minus x, x hat over. And now it's gonna be a separation vector cubed. And this is dx here. And finally, the last thing unknown that we're gonna get into things that we know is gonna be this r this, uh, the magnitude of the separation vector, which we found to be uh, here. Again, I'll just write it more explicitly, c squared plus x squared. Square root, of course. So we'll go ahead and make that. So we'll just make that the same. Nothing changed in the glob of constants out in the front. We have our z, z hat minus x, x hat. Over, now it's gonna be z squared plus x squared to the three halves now. And it's all gonna be in terms of dx, right? At this point, um, we're just gonna be uh, attacking it with some math. Most of this setup has just been done in this portion. Again, just as a recap until we got here, we went ahead and made a substitution for this, this, and this, using all the geometry and the, the just the first principles that we learned from just basic unit vectors here. So now we're gonna go ahead and attack this integral uh, I'm going to go ahead and just separate it into, so since we have the two components, we're just going to separate it into the two components. So I'll go ahead and just put, keep the glob of constants to the same, make a big bracket since we're going to go ahead and break this integral up into two integrals. So the first integral is just going to be the z hat uh, component. So it's going to be z over z squared plus x squared to the three halves in the z hat direction, dx. And now we're gonna go ahead and minus the, uh, the x component. And then it's the same thing here, three halves. Oops, here we go. And then one thing I'm just gonna go ahead and point is that since this integral is both in terms of dx, the way the integral looks at this z right here is just a constant so that z can move out in front 
although there's still an x in here, but we can't do it here. That's gonna be a different integral, so I'm just gonna go ahead and scroll up here and clear this. There we go. And let's see here. We got, we'll go ahead and attack the first integral, so we have zero to d. Right, this is the most general sense, and, and I highly rec recommend that you uh, either memorize these, or after doing enough problems, actually, you're gonna um, you're gonna end up memorizing them anyways. So I just highly recommend just having these on standby until you do enough problems in the textbook that you end up memorizing this. But in the most general sense, that uh, this integral right here, which is analogous to this one, is gonna end up being into this form. So we'll go ahead and write that out make that substitution where we still have that glob of constants multiplied by both of the components, whereas this integral, in, in terms of if we overlay it into this integral evaluated right here, so in this sense, our L is actually the D here, so it's gonna be, uh, let's see here, so the Z remained uh, untouched by it, so we do have an L out in front and then the constant square was actually the z squared. It, the integral v z as the constant times the square root of what we had. So I'm just going to go ahead and just do the square root here. And this is an x that was replaced with an integral. All right. And then we'll, and then plus, or actually minus the rest of this stuff, which I'm just going to go ahead and copy it down here. All right, so the next one, the next integral is attacking this one where it's different than the previous integral that we had right here is because this uh, x right here is actually gonna be viewed by the integral as a constant system. It is a dx constant, so, or dx integral. And this is the respective integral that's used for this one. So it's whenever you have a, an x over the value of x squared plus c squared, where c is just some constant raised to three halves in terms of dx is actually equal to one over the absolute value of that constant that was in there minus the uh, the ratio that you originally had in the first place. There we go. So we'll just go ahead and overlay the applicable integral for this one and apply it to our integral that we have. So it's equal to our glob of constants times nothing changed with this one. I'll just go ahead and, no, I'll write it explicitly actually. Though is it bothering me? We'll move the Z hat to the very back, just the way I happen to do things. I will do, make this, so this is actually just a Z on the bottom. Z times Z squared, L squared all under the square root here, minus, now we applied our integral. I'm gonna go ahead and move it down a little bit. So we have the quantity of one over the absolute value of the constant. In our case, the constant was just the z, and z is we'll just keep z here as as this, since we know for a fact that z is is positive in this direction right here, or it could be negative actually. But uh, I'll show you; it ends up being the same out no matter what. So we'll go ahead and do one over l or one over z, and then minus the square root of uh, the limit that we did the square root two times the constant, which was z squared here. A little out of order, but. And then all against the uh, x hat. So that's all the x hat component and the quantity, right? So at this point, we basically found out our, let me go ahead and write out the constants here since we're at a good stopping point for this, por this portion of the problem. This portion of the problem is essentially done, right? We did find the electric field in terms of everything we know, but we do have another part of the problem that we need to address is that whenever the limit that z is really, really far away, we want to show that the electric field does approach the same, at, this whole thing ends up looking like some sort of a, a point charge. So it's gonna looking, end up looking like some sort of q times some separation vector in that direction, where in our case, the separation vector is actually just gonna be uh, this is going to be z, and this is going to be pointing in the z hat direction. And the way is just to draw it real quick. So if we have our point that we're going to be taking our um, 
our electric field at, and then we just keep moving it further, further away. The further, further away that we're going to move it, this uh, this line charge is actually just going to end up looking slowly, looking like some sort of uh, point charge. The further and further that we move it away. So when we do that, where Z is much, much larger than L, we can go ahead and apply that to what we have right here. So again, so we have just R lambda equals four pi epsilon naught times the quantity of. In this case, uh, when, when Z is much larger than L, this kind of just looks like essentially zero compared to our L, right? Or compared to the Z. So we have L over Z, and then since this is actually ends up turning into zero, this is just going to be, the z squared is going to be the only thing that lives under the square root. And so that's just going to be z itself. So this whole thing ends up going to z squared, so z times z here, right? So that gives us promise, and hopefully this will be the th only thing that is left over. When we look at this section right here, this 1 over z ends up just staying the same. And then here is the same case where this L squared ends up looking like zero compared to how big the Z is. So it's just gonna be over one over Z squared under the square root, which is just one over Z in the X hat direction. And as you can tell, one, mi or one over Z minus Z is equal to zero. And so all that is left over is this portion right here, which is just our one over four pi epsilon naught pointing in the z hat direction with some z squared. And then as you can see, it's just our line charge density times the length of that uh, of that line charge or the, or the amount that that line charge density is smeared out. And that's just actually equal to Q because remember Q is equal to, or actually, I mean, it's all the same, but the line charge density is defined as the, the some sort of charge that's smeared out over that line charge density there. And that is, showing that it is true in the sense that whenever you move this charge further, further away from this line charge density, it ends up converging to uh, just a normal point charge. And that's always just a good check to do for all of your electrostatics problems.